Uh, my clock says 6.30, so I'd say it's, it's time to go ahead and get started on this webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Evans, and I'm an ex extension forester here with the University of Illinois, and um, I'm happy to be, to be presenting in this Four Seasons Gardening webinar series. Um, I'm doing the Green Pathway to Invasion and Ornamental Invasive Plants, and I think it's a good, uh, a good topic to start off on um, for the year. I, I do know that... Um, Landowners, people that are, um, you know, using plants, making choices of what they put in the ground, um, have a lot of uh, important decisions to make in terms of what they choose and how that influences, you know, what ultimately may become invasive or not. So I hope to uh, kind of talk about invasive species a little bit during this presentation at the beginning, kind of why we're concerned about them, um, what's the big deal behind invasives, why it's important to consider those kind of get into how plants become invasive, what kind of damage they do, uh, and then really spend the, the majority of the time uh, really discussing this idea of ornamental invasive plants, species that started out as ornamentals, kind of why that is in particular a big issue, and then what landowners, uh, citizens can do uh, about this issue. I will ask that um, everybody make sure their phones, their microphones are muted. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end. Uh, if along the time of the presentation, if you do have questions, you can feel free to type them into the chat box and we'll either address them right then, but uh, ideally we'll kind of wait to the end of the presentation and, and address those questions and any other questions you may have. Uh, this presentation is being recorded, so you'll be able in a few days, uh, we'll upload it to our YouTube uh, page and you'll be able to, to look at this as well as um, previous recordings from previous webinars. Alrighty, with that, let's go ahead and get started. So invasive species are a major issue, uh, not only in Illinois, but you know, across uh, the United States and really across the world. And kind of regardless of where you go, uh, what habitat you work in, um, whether it's terrestrial, aquatic, uh, forest, prairies, urban areas, residential areas, if you're doing anything with natural resources, invasive species are, are something that you have to consider. Um, sites like what we see in this picture here, almost everything you see in this kind of opening, that gray-green color, that's all autumn olive uh, and an invasive that's um, particularly bad in, in, in Illinois. Um, it's, it's not an uncommon scene to find sites like this. Um, some of our forests are dominated by species like uh, Amur honeysuckle, which you see here just load it into the site, making it difficult to utilize uh, this forest, making it difficult to recreate. Wildlife has a hard time going through there. So there's a lot of issues with invasive species, uh, and in particular invasive plants. And it's something that we often don't just uh, face one at a time. A lot of times um, we have multiple species coming at us at one time, um, and it makes managing them a challenge, it makes dealing with them a challenge when um, you've got multiple fronts in there and each one has different management strategies that are needed. Uh, each one has the different abilities to, to, do in, to do damage or to impact our, our natural environment. So we have this suite of invasive species uh, that are out on the landscape in Illinois. And as I mentioned, really any habitat you're in, whether it's aquatics or wetlands, terrestrials, forest, uh, you have a, a series of invasive species that are, that are causing impacts. Um, just to kind of start things out, I like to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of definitions. And, and invasive species is a term that's used quite a bit. You see it uh, um, being applied in a lot of different situations. So I wanted to make sure that um, we're all clear on kind of what I consider uh, an invasive and in this talk what I'm, what I'm talking about when I say an invasive species. And to me, those are species that are not native to that ecosystem. They're not naturally found there, or they didn't naturally migrate there in their own means. Uh, they have since escaped and naturalized, so that means they have free living populations um, that are now into the, the natural systems. And then those populations grow to a level uh, and to an amount that causes some kind of damage. Uh, they disrupt or have a potential to disrupt natural communities, ecological functionings, and this leads to this um, ecological damage, potentially economic damage, there's some kind of negative impacts uh, that result from the invasive species being in the environment and that's why we consider them 
uh, invasive and can call those species uh, invasive species. There's plenty of examples of um, species that are not native to the ecosystem that have escaped and naturalized and then don't take that next step to, to cause damage. And so while those are exotic species or alien species or, or non-native, all those terms, um, if they don't do that damage, they don't cause that level of disruption, uh, we don't classify them as being an invasive uh, species. So that's an important distinction. Um, alien or exotic and invasive are not synonymous. And in the same way, I hear uh, several native species being called invasive quite a bit. You'll hear poison ivy or red cedars or even um, ragweeds uh, being called invasive. Um, and when in fact those are native species and they may be something that in the course of our management we decide to, to manage them and to control them at some level, but the fact that they are native to the ecosystem and a natural part of the ecosystem uh, means that we don't consider those invasive. They're just aggressive natives. So that's kind of the different uh, different categories that we're talking here. And, and again, for invasive species, it's the non-native species that cause some kind of damage to our ecosystem. So how do these become invasive, um, particularly when we're talking about invasive plants? Really, uh, they're, they're faster or more efficient at acquiring uh, these limited resources that all plants need to survive. Um, as we all know, plants need water, sunlight, nutrients, and space to be able to, to live, to thrive, to survive. And uh, if one species is faster at acquiring those, more efficient at using them, uh, or has the ability to block out and prevent the other species from acquiring those resources, then uh, it, it kind of wins out in competition. It's able to grow a little faster and then over time become dominant and even displace those other species. And so we see uh, our invasive species that we have have the ability um, to do this. They have the ability to acquire these resources in a more efficient or, or faster way. And they do it through several means. Uh, many of our invasive plants have very high seed production. This is a picture here of Japanese chaff flower. It's a major issue in the, the southern quarter of the state here in Illinois. Um, tons of seed per acre. Uh, there's some invasive species that even go uh, you know, much higher than that. Uh, one example would be uh, princess tree or polonia. One tree is estimated to make over 3 million seeds a year. Um, purple loosestrife is another plant that produces minute seeds that uh, can produce them in the millions as well. So a lot of these invasive plants just overwhelm the seed bank through high seed production. Others have longer growing seasons. Uh, so the bush honeysuckles that we have here in Illinois, they have a phenology that's quite a bit different than our native shrubs. On average, they leaf out oh, two weeks earlier uh, than our native shrubs and they stay green two and a half to even three weeks longer than our native shrubs. So over the course of a season, these uh, invasive honeysuckles have four to five weeks, oh, you know, over a month more photosynthetic time than our natives do. So it's no surprise that they are able to use that um, sunlight a little more then and be able to grow fast, um, form these dense thickets, and really um, take advantage of that extra that extra time to, to grow uh, that allows them allows them to really grow fast. Um, some modify the habitat and actually change the habitat to make it more suitable for them. So kudzu is a species that we think of as being a southern species and, and you know the vine that ate the south and all of this but uh, in actuality we do have quite a bit of kudzu across the state here in Illinois as well. And it's a, it's a vine that is typically shade intolerant, which means it needs a high light environment to grow. If it grows under a forested canopy or tries to grow under a forested canopy, there's not enough light to sustain it. So uh, what kudzu can do is grow up and climb up into the trees, grow over the trees and um, shade them out, kill them. In doing so, it's, it's moving that high light environment farther and farther into the edge of the forest. So it modifies that habitat to make it more suitable for itself. Others grow early uh, and take advantage of, of that early phenology in the spring. And garlic mustard is a great example. Here it is. Um, you know, it's one of our first invasive species to start growing early in the spring. 
pretty tall, uh, you know, three, four feet tall in the, in the forested understory. And it does all this reproduction and this growth quite early. So it, take, it takes advantage of that higher light environment and then directly competes with our spring wildflowers that also need that high light environment. But it does so by moving its phenology and its growth pretty early into the season. And then we're also finding out that a lot of these invasive plants uh, have some allelopathic properties. And if you're not familiar with allelopathy, it's something that a lot of plants have, whether they're native, exotic, uh, kind of regardless of that. Uh, the classic example would be black walnut. We all know that there's certain things that you can't plant under a black walnut because it won't grow there. Uh, because the black walnut itself will uh, exude chemicals out of its roots that change the soil properties. Again, many plants do, uh, do this kind of practice different types of allelopathy. What we're finding is that a really high percentage of invasive plants tend to have allelopathic properties. They do this chemical warfare, they change the soil prop the chemical properties in the soil to favor them over other plants. It seems to be a pretty common strategy among invasives. And so these invasive species, you know, they they have this higher um, higher seed production, faster growth, and all of these other practices and all of these other properties, in large part because in the new environment with they're, they're in, uh, they're kind of free from natural pests and diseases, insects that feed on them, these kind of natural checks and balances um, that arise when a, a plant or an organism you know, evolves in an ecosystem. And they're in their native range, there's a host of, of insects, pathogens, diseases, whatnot, that naturally um, feed upon the, those plants. And those plants over time have developed strategies to resist those. And so they've kind of came into an equilibrium. Uh, when those invasive species are moved into this new environment, uh, some of them then um, are, are unpalatable to our native insects. Our, our, some of our native diseases don't feed on them or don't host them, or they're not able to, to, to get on them. And so those invasive plants are, are freed from some of these checks and balances. So it allows them to produce a little more seed or grow a little faster. And that's kind of the strategy or the, the mechanism behind how they become invasive. We do know that uh, invasive species are becoming universally recognized as a priority issue across the, the U.S. and across the world, really, in terms of conservation and natural resources. Uh, our Forest Service here uh, in the United States consider, considers invasive species one of the four major threats to uh, our forest and grasslands, uh, right up there with fragmentation, habitat loss, and climate change. So it, it's really right up there with our major our conservation issues of the day. Uh, in Illinois, we have a wildlife action plan, and this action plan is our our pathway and our strategy for managing our rare and declining wildlife, or wildlife that's in most need of assistance. And that plan for our state considers uh, invasive species one of the six primary challenges to conserving and managing our, our rare wildlife here in the state. And any state you go to, it's going to be a similar story. They're just a, a major issue uh, nowadays. Just some, uh, uh, some examples of uh, our invasive species here in the state, uh, here in Illinois, and, and how, they, how they do damage. Uh, garlic mustard, uh, we've already talked about, but it is one of those plants that have uh, allelopathic properties. Uh, mustards, in general, are plants that don't need to associate with the uh, uh, fungal communities in the soil, the mycorrhizae in the soil. Um, they don't need to do that to be able to take up nutrients. A lot of other plants really have to have some association with mycorrhizae in the soil uh, with their roots to kind of help be able to take up nutrients and help grow. Since mustards in general don't do that, garlic mustard is a plant that actually exudes uh, basically a fungicide out of its roots that inhibits the growth of mycorrhizae in the soil, keeps that from being developed, and that gives it a competitive edge where the other plants are unable to take up uh, as many nutrients and grow as, as they normally would, lacking that mycorrhizae. Garlic mustard doesn't need that, so it allows it to, to again, have that competitive edge um, and then grow out. And we're seeing in that fact that garlic mustard is, it helps enable garlic mustard to create these big stands um, in, our, in our forest. Uh, Japanese stiltgrass is a major problem in the southern third of the state. Uh, and then some research coming out of Eastern Illinois University has shown that um, infestations, when uh, Japanese stillgrass moves into a forest, they had some long-term vegetation plots. And they found in these plots 
that um, within two or three years of Japanese stiltgrass showing up, it just kind of naturally migrated into these uh, plots that they lost about half their species. And so we tend to see a reduction in species diversity following invasion, and, and stiltgrass is certainly one of those that, that can do that. Um, and then it's not just plant-on-plant plant fighting or competition. Uh, we're finding that invasive species actually have uh, cascading impacts uh, on multiple trophic levels. Um, and, and one great example of that uh, are these exotic shrubs that we have. And, and exotic shrubs in general are some of our, our worst problems. Um, bush honeysuckle, common buckthorn, autumn olive, some of these species. Uh, there's been some research showing that um, these exotic shrubs tend to branch differently than our native shrubs. They branch typically a little lower to the ground, um, and those that branching is at a point, those first branches are at a point where uh, they're a little more exposed in the sense that since they're lower to the ground, they're not in, not in heavy leaf foliage. And because of that, birds that happen to nest uh, in exotic shrub-dominated forest, their nests tend to be lower to the ground, tend to be a little more open um, and vulnerable than what, if they would nest in native shrubs. And so there's some studies that have shown that there's been drastic increases in nest predation of bird species uh, in invaded forest versus uninvaded forest. Uh, raccoons, black rat snakes, whatever, these nest predators are just able to locate and find those nests a lot easier. So while uh, on appearances it looks like these exotic shrubs are good for the birds, they utilize them, it's heavy cover. In some instances they're finding that even though the birds do use them and seek them out because of this, um, they're actually not very good for the birds, again, because they're, they're not able to successfully nest in them. And then you add to that um, bush honeysuckle particularly, like we talked about, it leafs out quite a bit earlier than our uh, native shrubs. And then that's having impacts on reptiles. Uh, reptiles, when they emerge in the spring from hibernating, they often need a highlight environment. They need able to bask in the sun to be able to warm up um, initially and to be able to move around and, and make it in those early spring environments. And then typically they come out, they erupt, emerge uh, at a time when there's our trees don't have leaves on them, our shrubs, our native shrubs aren't leafed out, and they can have that, that sunshine to help them warm up. Uh, something like bush honeysuckle that moves in that has that earlier phenology and leaves out earlier, it's basically taking those highlight basking sites away from reptiles. They come out, they try to bask, and now uh, those sites are shaded out. And so there's some research showing that snakes in general um, that that need this early basking site, they're actually leaving and moving and not using invaded forest um, simply because they don't have what they need in there structurally. And then some really fascinating research, uh, it's a hot topic right now, is the fact that uh, invasive shrubs tend to create a little bit higher humidity at the soil layer. Soil layer. They produce very dense foliage, which is really good habitat for ticks, and also it allows the ticks to come in close association with um, small mammals and birds. And then all of that leads to uh, higher increases in ticks, and in particular, tick-borne disease prevalence within those ticks. So invaded woods um, have more ticks, and a lot of those ticks have are carrying tick-borne diseases. And so that's a major, um, not only an ecological change, but a, a big human health issue. Uh, that we're seeing due to invasion and again those cascading impacts. Um, so when a plant becomes invasive uh, there's kind of stages. It's not really steps you move through but it's um, I guess filters if you will from any plant that becomes introduced um, they have to kind of go through these filters to become invasive and, and not all of them do and in fact very few of them do. So lots of plants are introduced um, but they have to be able to escape, which basically means they have to be able to reproduce, uh, create seedlings, create young, and be able to move out into the, um, you know, out into the, the not planted, out into the wild. Those escaped individuals then have to be able to naturalize, um, and that's forming free-living populations that are self-sustaining. When they're in that case, we call them uh, established plants. And then those established populations have to be able to uh, do some level of damage, some level of disruption before they come invasive. So uh, our exotic plants, um, some of them stop at all these different steps, right? There's some that are introduced and never go anywhere. There's some that escape and never naturalized. 
some that establish and naturalize but never become invasive and then there's some that end up do becoming invasive so this is kind of a, 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 um, the process again or the, the kind of levels where plants stop along the way and we're finding that uh, by no means do all exotic plants become invasion, invasive in fact it's only a real small portion of these species that are introduced end up becoming invasive plants a uh, very small portion. The problem is that the level of damage um, from these these smaller number of plants can be pretty high, right? We know all the the millions of acres uh, across the United States that are are impacted by just bush honeysuckle, for example. Um, there's this thing called the tens rule, and I don't really like calling it the tens rule. I prefer it more of kind of a guideline, or, or it's a it's a I guess it's a way of describing what's happening on the on the on the ground or what we see or what we're seeing with invasive species. And this this concept or theory basically says that the, the data shows out that about 10% of species are able to pass through each of these transitional phases from introduction to invasive. And just to show that, uh, for example, say if you had a thousand species that were introduced. Out of those thousand different species that are introduced, only about 10% of those, or 100 species, are able to escape. The rest of them um, are never able to reproduce or escape, um, or if they do try to escape, they just can't live in there. Um, out of those 100 that have escaped, only 10% or 10 of those are able to naturalize. The climate's the right match. They're able to, to live in there and form those free-living free populations. Out of those 10 plants that are able to naturalize, uh, those 10 species, only on average about one of them ends up becoming a problematic invader. So what we're seeing is that on average uh, about one out of every thousand introduced species ends up becoming invasive. Again it's a small amount. There's thousands and thousands of species introduced to the to the United States. Many of them never are able to escape. They're house plants, uh, agricultural plants, different things that never m make that first step, the vast majority of them. Um, but again, one out of every thousand seems like a small amount. The problem is those few that end up becoming invasive causes uh, a lot of problems. Uh, the first big step is, of course, they need to have a suitable climate. Uh, this is just a map showing climate of the, of the world based on temperature and moisture. If you see uh, the map there, here in Illinois, we're in that dark green, uh, the southern part of the states into that light yellow. If you look at other parts of the world that, that have similar habitat, you see a lot of Europe uh, and Eastern Asia uh, are two big areas that, that have that similar habitat. So it's a uh, similar climate, I should say. Um, it's no surprise then that many of our invasive species are from those areas. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle, Chinese privet, um, things like garlic mustard and purple loosestrife, which are European, uh, in European origin. Uh, it's similar that basically they're able to, they evolved in those climates. They come over to uh, the Eastern United States and there's a very similar climate very similar soils and so they, they do well. If you go to the western United States in those more arid environments, uh, their, uh, their invasives tend to be species kind of from the arid steppes, you know, Mongolia, parts of Siberia, places like that, again, because it's a climate match. So these species got here um, and they were introduced. It could be accidentally introduced or even intentionally introduced by humans, but they um, they didn't naturally evolve here and they didn't migrate here on their own. There's some barrier of in, inhospitable habitat that kept them from getting here on their own. Uh, usually that's, um, you know, a salty ocean, something like that, a mountain chain, deserts. It's some kind of habitat that they're unable to use and it's of such size that they're not able to kind of cross over that habitat and move here on their own. So they've, they've jumped over those barriers um, by being aided by humans and have been introduced by us. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons uh, plants get introduced. There's a lot of accidental introductions. Uh, they could be seed or plant material contaminants, soil contaminants, ballast waters, a major way of uh, aquatic invasives getting introduced. Uh, packing material is one. Think about emerald ash borers. We know it's a major invasive insect in the US and, and really bad in, in Illinois right now, it was an accidental introduction. Nobody intentionally decided to introduce emerald ash borer. It basically hitched a ride in some wood dunnage or, or packing material or crates and was accidentally introduced here. And so a lot of our plants, a lot of our invasives are that way, but there are a lot of intentional introductions. Plants have been introduced for erosion control, for agriculture, uh, for wildlife. 
and as ornamentals. And so what I wanted to spend the rest of the time is, is talking about, in particular, those plants that are uh, would, were intentionally introduced as ornamentals and then ended up becoming invasive. Um, it is, in fact, a major pathway of introduction and spread. We're finding that a lot of our invasive species kind of started out as ornamentals. And in some way, it's not surprising if you, if you look at the traits of what makes a, a good ornamental, a desirable ornamental plant, and then compare that to the, some of the traits of what makes a very bad, uh, problematic, invasive. And then you start to see a lot of similarities. Uh, for instance, a good ornamental is something that's hardy, easy to grow. A bad invasive is a habitat generalist. It, it grows anywhere. Good ornamentals are carefree. They don't require attention. Bad invasive species outcompete other plants. They kind of take care of themselves. Good ornamentals are easy to propagate. Bad invasives reproduce easily. A good ornamental may have showy, abundant flowers. We know many of our bad invasives have abundant seeds. So you're starting to see these similarities. Many of our good ornamentals, we like them because they may attract birds. A lot of our woody invasive plants in particular have bird dispersed seeds. And then, we, of course, we want all our ornamental plants to be pest and disease resistant. And one way that invasive species become problems is that they're not affected by our native pests and diseases. So you can kind of see some of those same characteristics we search for in, a, in an ornamental plant tends to be some of the exact same characteristics that allow those plants to become uh, invasive. And there's some data uh, from a few years ago now, but looked at all the different woody invasive plants in the United States. And all of those different woody invasive plants um, ended up being 82% of those uh, had their origins in horticulture. So they started out as ornamental plants. Uh, and that's, you know, it's a high number. That's a major pathway for these woody invasive plants to start out as ornamentals. And there's a lot of them, right? Even the bush honeysuckles, common buckthorns, autumn olive, they kind of started out in some ways as ornamental plants. Um, even kudzu. Kudzu was called porch vine in the south, and it was planted a lot as an ornamental. Uh, it was also planted for erosion control and for wildlife for or, or cattle forage as well, but it did have uh, a use as an ornamental. So again, we see a lot of that, particularly in our woody invasive plants. Uh, I always like looking online and seeing uh, some of these invasive plants for sale, and this is that polonia or empress tree. And you see it's touted as the fastest growing tree in the world. And that should be a pretty good indication that you need to uh, take a look at that again and, and see just to, if you actually want it. And looking farther, you know, it shows that it's 15 feet of growth a year, spring flowers, it's not prone to diseases or insects, it's adaptable to wide ranges, and it's drought intolerant, right? So it, again, it's describing those characteristics that would make it a good ornamental plant. But those are exactly the same characteristics that allows this plant to really escape and start causing problems. So, you know, I, saying that landowners and people plant these, uh, you know, it's it's not always um, it's not always it's not out of malice or anything. So I kind of categorize um, why landowners uh, or or other people use these invasive ornamental plants. And I think there's really kind of three different categories of why they do. And, and the first one is a lack of knowledge. I think they simply don't know that the species they're planting are invasive. Um, they haven't thought about that. They haven't even considered it. So kind of a, just a lack of awareness or a lack of knowledge of those species are one reason why they're, they're planted. The second, I would say, is a lack of understanding. And so that could be that um, they know, they've heard that those, those species uh, that they're using may be an invasive, but they don't realize the, the scope of the problem uh, or the issue at hand. They may not realize that it's that damaging or really understand uh, how their plants they plant contribute to this problem of invasive species. Uh, and then some are, are planted just from mistaken identity. Uh, they may not, they may have been told that those species aren't invasive and aren't a problem. Or they may actually, uh, the plants they buy are mislabeled. They're buying something other than they think they are. Uh, one good example of that was some recent research coming out of a history survey in the University of Illinois, where they looked at, um, at plants that are sold as American bittersweet. So these are um, plants that are touted as being one of our good native plants that you can use. And they found that actually, uh, very often, the plants that are sold as American bittersweet ended up being uh, instead the invasive oriental bittersweet, which is illegal to buy and sell in, the, in Illinois. Um, but the, the plants that people thought they were getting ended up not being the case, and they actually instead end up 
getting an invasive. Well, there, you know, there's some issues there, too. That's just another reason of why people move these around. Um, to kind of combat that one in particular, I'll just throw in a pitch here that we have this um, quick guide uh, look, by looking at fruit characteristics, how to tell American and Oriental bittersweet apart. And so that's available from the um, Extension Forestry Program. So I wanted to spend just a minute or two here talking about three uh, common ornamental plants that also are becoming invasive in the state, just as examples of some of these, again, some of these ornamental invaders. Uh, the first is collery pear. Uh, you've probably heard it uh, more often by its cultivar names, Bradford pear, Cleveland pear. There's a lot of different cultivars. Uh, but these flowering pears are all cultivars of um, collery as the species. Deciduous small trees, very widely planted as ornamentals. People like them because they flower early. They have nice fall color. Uh, they don't have very little. They have very little wildlife value. And then now we're seeing that they're really escaping widely, um, not only in Illinois but across much of the eastern United States, and showing a lot of invasive tendencies. Um, the picture to the top right there shows, you know, kind of what had happened, especially with some of the earlier cultivars. They were a little prone to cracking and breaking. But when they escape, they really do look quite a bit different. And, and if you don't know what you're looking at, you may even not even recognize them as the same species. Uh, escaped individuals kind of revert back to the old wild type. They have smaller leaves. They're more multi-stemmed and, uh, and shrubby-like. And then they actually regain their thorns. So it, it does look quite a bit different than the ornamental cultivars. And then here in a couple weeks across the state, uh, you're going to start seeing a lot of white flowering trees along our roadsides. If you do, the chances are uh, you're looking at collery pears because they have been found uh, across the state now, uh, widely distributed and again called, starting to cause some problems. This is an interesting one because it was touted as being a sterile plant and actually for uh, quite a few years it really was and didn't escape. And the reasoning behind it was, uh, as a species, collery pear as a species is an obligate outcrosser, meaning that it can't self-fertilize itself. So a flower on one plant is unable to pollinate a flower on that same plant. They have to have cross-pollination. Well, the cultivars are, re are reproduced or propagated asexually, I mean, from stem cuttings. So genetically, each individual of that cultivar is genetically the identical. They're basically the same thing. They're just cuttings from the same individual. So they're self-incompatible. So a Bradford pear is unable to pollinate a Bradford pear variety. Uh, what happened was all the new varieties coming on board, uh, new varieties being developed, particularly to deal with the uh, uh, cracking issue and some of the, the problems with some of the earlier varieties, were genetically different enough that it allowed for cross-pollination. So when those new varieties became popular, that's when we started seeing um, this plant really be able to escape and move around. Uh, winged burning bush is another one that's uh, it's a big issue. Burning bush, winged euonymus, some people call it winged wahoo, uh, not to be mistaken with our native um, eastern wahoo, which is our, one of our native euonymus. But burning bush is a, is a big issue, you know, again, widely planted as an ornamental, uh, but it's a well-established invasive now throughout the U.S. And then the land that I manage in southern Illinois, uh, this is one of our number one problems. You know, it's no, no surprise that it's a super popular plant. It's a gorgeous plant, a beautiful, it has a lot of uh, positive characteristics that make it a, a good ornamental plant. But if you look at the picture on the top left, that red hue on the ground, those are all seedlings. Um, so this thing is a prolific seed producer and really does escape. And then you see it in, the, uh, into the, in our forest causing a problem. A lot of states have already started to ban uh, this or to ban some of the high seed cultivars of it. Um, kind of scattered throughout the state. I'm sure it's actually more widespread than what's indicated um, with this map, but this is the data that we have. And then the same thing can go for Japanese barberry. We know that it's a... Uh, um, you know, also a widely planned species, also has bird dispersed seeds, and then we're seeing it escape throughout the U.S. There's a lot of different cultivars of Japanese um, barberry. Some have different statures, different heights, different growth forms, different foliage colors. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, kind of regards to those cultivars, when they tend to escape and, and, and form these escaped populations, uh, they tend to revert back to the wild type. 
So even if it's a small ye yellow foliage uh, variety, uh, when it escapes over time, they end up becoming, again, that kind of wild type, the normal plant. And then we're seeing this. This is a shot from uh, New England here where it's just dominating uh, in this forest, but we're actually seeing it across Illinois as well, really become one of our fastest spreading uh, uh, species. We're finding it more and more in our woods across the state, even in high quality forest. And so, you know, here's the map showing there. Again, this is probably even a little underrepresented uh, here, but you know, it's something that uh, was surprising to me of how much we're starting to see this plant move across the state. Uh, there's some other uh, invasive ornamental species, just ones to, to keep an eye out on and, and to realize they're invasive privets. Uh, we really see spread around. Cork tree is a little used ornamental, but um, it's one that uh, both in northern Illinois and in southern Illinois, both we're starting to see uh, a lot of escape populations. Uh, princess tree and winter creeper are just two more that are, are in the past have been really commonly used, but again are, are, are considered invasive and, and causing problems. So what can landowners do about this issue of, of ornamental invasives? And, you know, they can explore alternative options, find other species to use than these invasives. But the big thing is to really start noticing, um, are these species escaping? Are plants that you're using on the landscape, are you finding them in the woods next to your area? Are you finding seedlings crop up a bunch? Just kind of start paying attention to see if they are moving around. And if you do have invasive species, consider replacing those existing uh, plantings with, um, with diff something different and then keeping up to date on invasive species list and invasive species uh, distributions find out from people that are, are looking for these things or researching these things and kind of what's the latest thoughts on which ones are invasive or what are the latest regulations uh, here in illinois we, we regulate uh, invasive plants really with two different laws so we have the illinois exotic weed act and so this is really targeted towards our terrestrial uh, invasive species that impact natural areas it makes uh, being on this list makes it illegal for anybody to buy, sell, or distribute uh, these plants uh, within the state. It's a good act. Up until um, up until a couple years ago, we only had a fairly restricted number of species on it. There were multiple buckthorns, and then purple loosestrife, kudzu, Japanese honeysuckle, and multiflora rose, and that was it. So while the law was a well-written law, it was the the list wasn't really expanded. Uh, so in 2015. Um, we added a lot of species to the list, uh, and so that was made a really the biggest expansion that we've had of this list. And we added all the bush honeysuckles, giant hogweed, and lesser celandine, uh, poison hemlock, all the salt cedars, the three exotic olives we have in the state, which are Russian olive, autumn olive, and thorny olive, uh, oriental bittersweet, our teasels, and then the three exotic knotweeds that are causing problems in the state. Uh, giant knotweed, Japanese knotweed, and bohemian knotweed. So while these are kind of low-hanging fruit, it was a good first step to, to go ahead and recognize these as invasive and problematic and go ahead and get them on our exotic weed list. Uh, the other rule that manages uh, or regulates invasive plants uh, is the Illinois Injurious Species Rule. So this is a rule that was administered by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources Division of Fisheries. And it started out just uh, mostly for injurious animals, so invasive animals uh, was the intent of the, the rule. But then they went ahead and decided to utilize this format to, to regulate aquatic invasive species. And so they, they added about 27 invasive plant species to this, this rule um, here, I think in 2014 is when they started the, the new additions. Um, this is the partial list of some of the species that are added, the hydrilla, Brazilian elodia, uh, Eurasian water milfoil, uh, water chestnuts. There's a bunch of different species added to, to this list. And so that, those are kind of the two major regulation uh, avenues for, for dealing with these invasive plants in the state. So what can uh, landowners do? So kind of just I want to end here just with a list of, of some recommendations of things that you can do, uh, anybody can do, landowners, uh, homeowners, citizens, what you can do to kind of address this issue of ornamental invasives. One of the things definitely is uh, use non-invasive alternatives. Stop using these invasive species. I always like to put in a plug for uh, higher use of native species because of the wildlife benefits and ecological benefits to using them. 
Uh, just an example here, this is some y YCC students down in southern Illinois helping to create a, a, a native wildflower garden in front of uh, uh, an office here. And if you haven't read the book Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy, it's a fantastic read. And, and the book is uh, really kind of focused on of how uh, landowners' use of native plants for landscaping, how that benefits wildlife and particularly butterflies and moths. So it's a, it's a great read, but it really is one to explore this topic a little more. But, you know, here in Illinois, we have some beautiful native species that um, um, that are just as good as any ornamental you'll see out there, right? Some beautiful colors out there, beautiful different species, unique species. Uh, and we literally have uh, plants that are every color of the rainbow that are native to our, our, our Illinois ecosystems. So I think finding some of these and utilizing some of these native species are something that we should uh, consider more. And the good thing is talking with the, the members of the green industry, they say that uh, demand is really increasing a lot for native species. It's one of the fastest growing sectors of the green industry nowadays. Um, controlling invasive plants sounds obvious, but that's definitely something we can do. If, you, if you're not a landowner that has invasive or has the ability to control invasive plants on their own land, if you don't have land, uh, consider volunteering for local forest preserves or local state parks. I know they're always um, welcome to have uh, people kind of coming out there and helping them. Again, just helping to control the issue. And I, I like it, um, this quote from the Nature Conservancy, and I think it really sums up why we control invasive species. And it says that we control invasive species because they are harming the native plants and animals we care so much about protecting. And I think that really is a good summary of why why we do what we do and why we are concerned about invasive species. Uh, you can learn more about our native ecosystems and our native plants. Uh, just um, educate yourself about what we have in Illinois, what are our native species, and kind of what's to lose if we do um, you know, let these invasives um, really run rampant. There's some good guides out there. Um, whether you just want a, a photo-based guide or a picture-based guide, or you're interested in more of a technical manual, there's a lot of uh, ones out there that you can look at to kind of uh, educate yourself about what we have. There's good websites uh, that are by kind of by habitat, so you can see what are the prevailing uh, native species are in these different habitats, so you're being able to identify them. There's a tons of resources out there for anybody that's interested in learning more about our, our native ecosystems and our native plants. Uh, and then kind of lastly, the, one of the big things we can do is, you know, spread the word and not the weeds. So um, educating people, uh, getting out there, teaching people that, hey, you're concerned about invasive species, why you're concerned about invasive species, and then uh, try to get them on board with this idea of um, the choices that they make in terms of what they, what they put in the ground for landscaping as ornamental plants can have an influence um, across the state and can influence um, this kind of prevalence of these invasive species. So getting out there and educating other people is definitely something that we all can do. And um, that was kind of the end of what I, I wanted to say to everybody today. Uh, I, I do want to put my information up here, my contact information. Uh, you'll see my email and my phone number here. And we'll say that uh, the Extension Forestry Program at the University of Illinois, we do a lot with invasive species. One of our big things we have coming up is on May 24th, we have our annual Invasive Species Symposium. And that's, that's uh, an opportunity for people to present uh, projects, programs, and research that's on invasive species in Illinois. We hold that, again, every year. This will be our fifth year. We hold it at the Champaign County uh, Extension Auditorium. And it's a, a great way to stay up to date on what's happening uh, in invasive species in the state. We also are, are definitely available if you have questions about invasive species, if you um, have information about how to control invasive species or you're looking for that. That's some of the stuff we do through Extension Forestry, so definitely don't hesitate to uh, get a hold of me if you have questions about that. Um, we are pretty active on social media. We post a lot of information out there about um, forestry in general, forest management, uh, and invasive species. So you can look us up on Facebook um, just by searching for Illinois Extension Forestry, or you can find us on Twitter at UIE Forestry. And again, those are um, we utilize those a lot. Right now, we've got this program going where every Monday we post a new tree quiz, so you can test your knowledge on our, our different tree species out there. 
uh, and it's a lot of fun. So again, um, be, uh, feel free to look us up, get involved that way with us, and, and see kind of what the programs we have coming up. I will add that, um, you know, just again, this this record this uh, program is being recorded, uh, and it's going to be added to the Four Seasons webinar series on a YouTube channel. So in a couple days, you can go back and listen to an archive of this, but feel free to go to this uh, YouTube channel, figure out what's happening, and see... Um, see uh, archives and videos from past um, webinars and so that's all up there and it's a great resource for for landowners or anybody in Illinois that's that's interested in gardening and, and some of the topics that we cover so please feel free to check that out and then after that I guess the next thing to do is if anybody has any questions um, about invasive species about the presentation you can either unmute your phone and, and, and uh, or your microphone and say it there, or you can type your questions into the chat box, either one, and uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to take them. So, so as you're typing your questions, again, I'll just... Um, um, recommend that if you want to jump onto our Facebook page or shoot me an email and I can add you to our um, our email list because we do have a lot of programs uh, going on across the state. Um, we just finished a series of programs in southern and western Illinois on emerald ash borer and preparedness and what communities and landowners can do to get ready uh, with that. So those are some of the programs but you can certainly get on that list um, um, just by emailing me uh, is one way to do it. All right, so questions coming in here. Um, so one question is, it seems like in hindsight, a lot of these plants shouldn't have been planted. Is there anything prospective uh, to limit the introductions of these plants? Uh, that's a good question. So um, yeah, you know, one of the things that's happening now kind of at a U.S. level is uh, more, they call them pest risk assessments. And so this is looking at plants before they get here doing more uh, research on trying to identify either species or groups of species or taxa that, that have a high uh, likelihood of becoming invasive. Ones that, uh, that, that indicate based upon its biology or its relatedness to other invasive species or other characteristics that it may end up becoming a problem. And so um, they get put on a list that they have to be evaluated further or looked at it before they're allowed into the U.S. So we're starting to do more of that kind of at a um, kind of at a nationwide level and then um, at a state level just doing those assessments as well and looking at these plants critically to try to identify the ones that are problematic and then adding them to our regulated list. Like I mentioned you know in 2015 we added quite a few species um, to that list and so you know there's there's things going on at a state level and then there's efforts through the USDA um, APHIS uh, plant protection and quarantine group to kind of look at it at a, a national level as well. It's a good question though. A uh, question about can you share how to get to the tree quiz again? So our tree quiz is a Monday tree quiz and that happens on our Facebook page and so we post uh, a tricky tree and ask people to, to comment on it and so that, um, again, you can find that by look, uh, searching for the Illinois Extension Forestry uh, on Facebook and then like our page. And then you'll, um, you can, you'll see our tree quizzes and feel free to jump in there and, and put your guesses in. Uh, question about hogweed. Does hogweed look like uh, lamb's quarter? No, hogweed's really a different. So hogweed is actually, um, it's, a really, it's in the carrot family. So it looks like, I always joke, jokingly call it, it looks like Queen Anne's lace on steroids. So it has um, a really big flower cluster um, that can be two feet across or more. And um, just a, uh, you know, those big white kind of umbels like you see on Queen Anne's lace, but it's huge. It has really big leaves that are kind of spiky, highly dissected. You should look it up. A giant, it's called giant hogweed. The reason that giant hogweed is a, uh, is a listed species and the reason we added it is because of health issues. So it is one of those species that has phytophotodermatitis, which means that if you get the sap on your skin in the uh, presence of sunlight, you'll get these really, really nasty blisters, a lot like wild parsnip, but a lot worse. 
and the chemicals can even cause blindness. There's a lot of issues with it. So due to these kind of health risk problems with hog reed, uh, it's a federal noxious weed, so it's listed federally, and we've also listed it um, uh, in the, for the state as well. So if somebody asks, can you please share your Facebook page name or link? I certainly can. Uh, I'll add that to the chat box here, if I can do that. There we go. You can just go on there and um, um, again like us on Facebook, something like that, and find us that way. And then Kari posted some pictures of the giant hogweed so you can see, uh, just see what it, it looks like there. That's a great resource. You can click on that. You can see some of these. Um, you can uh, Queen Anne's Lace on steroid pictures. Giant hogweed is a species that um, it's been in Illinois for a while. We have uh, we've had a few locations um, in the state, um, in the Chicago region. Um, it's one that we definitely jump in and try to uh, eradicate right away. It's one that we don't want to be established. So all the known populations in the state are under current management and trying, currently trying to uh, trying to eradicate that. That's one we want to uh, eliminate from the state, right? It's not one we want to live with. We want to get it out of here, again, because of those health issues. Uh, there are some native lookalikes, so definitely um, pay attention. If you think you have it, you know, do some research, look at it, but then also feel free to contact us. I get probably a couple dozen or more um, emails and reports of giant hogweed from across Illinois every year. And knock on wood, so far they're, they're, they've been lookalikes, um, other species, and that's the way I want it. I'm definitely happy to get these, and I'm really happy when it ends up not being giant hogweed. But uh, my email was uh, there earlier, uh, you're, and I'll put it here in the box, uh, in the chat box. But definitely feel free if you have questions about plants, uh, identification, or you're worried about a species, um, definitely feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, it's part of what I do. If you're interested in being one of our phenology volunteers, and so that's something where we have uh, we have a whole suite of volunteers across the state that actually go out monthly and collect data on invasive species, where they're at developmentally, you know, what state they're in, um, are they flowering, not flowering, those kind of things, and then report back to me. And so we we use that information to form a monthly report on kind of the 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 status of invasive species in terms of development uh, across the state. So if that's something that interests you and you, you want to contribute to that, that science that we're collecting, shoot me an email and I'll get you hooked up with that program as well. Well, um, not seeing any new uh, questions come in. I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, again, and feel free to uh, catch future uh, four season webinars as they come up. I think we've got another one coming up in a couple weeks. Um, so um, do that. Look at our, our past ones and our, our archived YouTube page. And I thank you all for attending. I'll stay on here for a few more minutes in case anybody has any other questions that come in. But otherwise, uh, have a great rest of the day.